thank you for coming tonight. And welcome to the report back from the Vancouver to Gaza delegation, Refugees, <laughs> Rights, Resistance, and Return. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on unceded Coast Salish territory. Um, you know, about 10 years ago, that was a statement that, that we didn't hear that often, but now it's becoming quite common in many gatherings. I think ordinary Canadians are really well aware of what happened to our First Peoples, and their struggle is, is has a lot of commonalities with the struggle of the Palestinian people. They resonate with each other. Um, I think one, one great difference is that the Canadian government and Canadian people particularly have begun to acknowledge exactly what happened to the people who lived here for 10,000 years before we all arrived. So that's the main difference. There has been no acknowledgement yet of the Palestinian people's right to live on their land. And so that's why we feel the urgent need to do this work. That's why the folks you'll hear from tonight um, felt the pressing need to, to, to go on with this work and to go to Gaza in a delegation. Now, if I wanted to go to Gaza and I wanted to take a delegation, and they range in age from 19 months to, well, about my age. <laughs> this time, I would definitely not try to do it on a boat, because that I found out how not to go to Gaza. Get on a boat, you will not get there. I'd call Khalid. I'd call Khalid Barakat. That's who you call if you really want to get to Gaza. <laughs> Khalid was the delegation coordinator He's a Palestinian writer and journalist. His work has been published widely in Arabic language media outlets, including Al Quds, Al Arabi, Al Badil Daily in Egypt, and um, Arabs 48, also As Safir of Lebanon. He's a longtime community organizer and uh, particularly in the Palestinian Arab communities in Vancouver and across North America. He's also active with Samedun Prisoner Solidarity Network, and he's co-founded Palestinian Solidarity Groups in Canada and in the US. So this is who we will call for our delegation, Khalid Barakat. Thank you, Karen. Don't listen to her. <laughs> um, my name is Khaled Barakat, and I was uh, honored to be a member of this delegation, uh, not uh, necessarily a coordinator, but a member of this, uh, of this delegation. Um, and uh, I am honored uh, that I was part of this efforts, um, and that we took this journey with a uh, few of our uh, friends and colleagues and comrades here in Vancouver that we work with and we organize with. But when you uh, organize a delegation um, to Gaza, uh, you get to know uh, these friends more and more and uh, you get to live with them and so you get to love them more. <laughs> today, today, actually, it's a national uh, day in Palestine, a very sad day, because uh, on July 22nd, we lost a great Palestinian artist, uh, cartoonist, his name Najil Ali. And Najil Ali is a legendary uh, legend in Palestine. Uh, his uh, Handala is his creation, and Handala is the conscious of the Palestinian people. Uh, particularly in the refugee camps, the impoverished Palestinian popular classes. Uh, and he was a, a true voice uh, for Palestinians, and that's why uh, he was killed. Um, Gaza today is not, of course, Gaza, you know, a few years back. Well, often we hear about the siege and 
the siege on Gaza is, is brutal one because as you all know, or most of you know, this siege was imposed on Gaza by the United States, uh, Israel, and the Egyptian regime of Hosni Mubarak. Uh, now that Hosni Mubarak uh, doesn't exist anymore, uh, but the regime, the, the, the Egyptian regime is, is still in place. So when this delegation decided to take that journey, Mubarak was not in Egypt, but the regime and the laws and uh, many of the policies that the regime uh, carried in, in terms of like uh, Gaza and the closures and the, clo the, the closure of Rafah crossing, the only port of entry to enter Gaza is through Rafah crossing. Uh, if that gate is closed, you can't go to Gaza. And the only way that you can go to Gaza is through uh, tunnels. And these tunnels were uh, a necessary uh, thing for, for our people in Gaza in order to uh, secure uh, the daily, their daily lives, the, the, the oxygen of, of Gaza, the products and water and cement and everything uh, basically that you see in the markets has to come through Gaza, uh, has to come through Egypt. Uh, and if, uh, so these tunnels are very important uh, and they were necessary. Throughout the journey from Cairo to uh, Gaza, we were hoping that uh, we will be allowed uh, to just uh, enter the Sinai Peninsula and then to Al Arish and go normally. But uh, we were stopped at a checkpoint. And it was interesting because it represented this transformation moment of Egypt. The country is going through this change now. So, so they weren't hostile or aggressive, uh, but they were uh, very firm that you're going to Gaza and we're not, you're gonna go, you're gonna have to go back to your Canadian embassy and get a permission from them that they, they're fine with that and then you have to contact the foreign ministry of Egypt and so it's, it's a whole, it's a whole, it's, it's again the same policies. Uh, they won't, and, and we did, we tried, we went to the, to the foreign ministry of Egypt and we tried to, to work out uh, some kind of a way that we, we go to Gaza and, and it was really difficult. Uh, so we were left with no option but to actually uh, go and, uh, and to go to Gaza through uh, the tunnels. And we did, and we were successful. And that was a victory for the legacy. <laughs> I'm not uh, going to speak about the situation in Gaza. I would leave that to my uh, colleagues. Uh, they, uh, they will be telling us uh, and telling you exactly the situation in Gaza as they have seen it on the, on the ground. But I do want to say that it is really important for anyone who can go to Palestine, uh, to the West Bank, to Gaza, to uh, Israel, anywhere in Palestine that you can go and see for yourself uh, the direct real experience, um, you, would see, uh, you would see a very brutal military occupation, you will see a racist uh, state, and you would see uh, people of Palestine resisting uh, to be victorious, and, and, and they will. Uh, I will introduce the uh, first speaker of the delegation. Uh, my friend Brian Campbell, he is the co-chair of the Seriously Free Speech Committee, uh, which seeks to uh, defend individuals and organizations who are attacked because of their criticism of Israel and their support for Palestinian human rights. Um, also, Brian is active with the um, BIAC, uh, 
the boycott Israeli apartheid committee. So please, Brian. Um, I want to make a couple of general comments first, and it's hard to make comment, general comments and then specific comments within eight minutes, but um, I will try. So it's important to understand that the visit we took is in the context of the siege in Gaza and the daily suffering that people are going through in terms of loss of electricity, uh, water that's contaminated, sewage that is not treated, high unemployment, 38%, Poverty, 38%. Lack of essential goods, including medicine and fuel. Constant military attacks and all of the anxiety and fear that that provokes. While we were there, 16 people in Gaza were killed in various bombardments that took place while we were there. And yet what you see is this tremendous resilience and endurance from the people that are there. When we were uh, staying where we were uh, billeted, um, we could hear bombs on a few of the evenings, and the children in the family were quite scared, but everybody else just understood that that was part of living in Gaza. And the thing that I guess surprised me a little bit as we heard stories throughout, as I will tell you some of the stories, is that the malevolence and viciousness of the individual implementation of the siege. Now, the siege is a state policy. And there are people that implement that, members of the IDF. But the way they implement it is in the most vicious way possible for the individuals to humiliate and embarrass them and cause them as much pain as possible when there are options, even within the context of the siege policy. And that could only happen, in my opinion, when the way they view Palestinians is in a thoroughly racist manner, that these are non-humans. So that is the fundamental context in which you're viewing what's happening in Gaza, that there's a siege in Gaza, an occupation in West Bank by people who do not consider Palestinians as human beings. And that's fundamentally, and there's all kinds of documentation in that. What I want to talk about specifically is the second day of our visit in Gaza where we were hosted by the Union of Agricultural Work Committees and we went to um, see the fishers and the farmers, some of the fishers and farmers in Gaza. The Gaza coastline is 4.1 miles long. It's a beautiful coastline. And all along the coastline, you're seeing small skiffs. Right. Do I not have some slides that are supposed to show? What? Well, we've gone a long way. These are other people's, okay. Well, okay. Well, we won't bother about that because at some point my, my pictures will show up. It's less important because in a little while, um, Jace will be showing a video of the, of the fishers. So um, originally there were 10,000 fishers in Gaza, supporting around 70,000 people. Israel has constantly retracted the area in which they can fish from 20 miles under the Oslo Accords to today, and since 2006, I believe, it's just three miles. And now the number of fishermen are 3,500, and 85% of the fishers live in poverty. And the other part of it is their major uh, catch from the point of view of income was sardines. Most of the sardines are outside the three mile limit. They're only able to catch small fish and we saw some examples of them. And those fish are young in terms of their adult life cycle. And so what they're doing is destroying the whole ecological balance of the fishery in the Mediterranean Sea by being forced into that three mile limit. Now, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN has done a very interesting report and they've called it Farming Without Land, Fishing Without Water. The Gaza Agricultural Struggle sur Struggles to Survive. And it's, very, uh, it's a very good report. Yes. Okay. So here's, we've got it now. 
And here are a group of the fishermen we met with, but the fellow in the beige, I want to mention him specifically in terms of the kind of viciousness that's exhibited there. He was on his fish boat. They were shot at. He was uh, shot in the knee, and you can see the way his leg is there. He was shot in the knee. Six fishers were arrested that day. They were taken to Ash Hood. Their boats were confiscated. They were put in prison. They were interrogated. And then he was taken to the border and told to walk back with his leg still shot up. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Now, the other thing is that these attacks are constant. There's been 92 attacks on the fishers just this year alone. And many of those have resulted in boats being confiscated, people being injured, and people being taken to Israel for arrest. And another example of the pettiness is they have the fishers strip down in their boat and swim to the Navy vessel. And they move the Navy vessel further and further out as people are swimming to them so that they're exhausted from their attempts to uh, get to the Navy ship. So the Union of Agricultural Workers uh, works with a lot of the fishers, provides them with um, organizational capability, the ability to get some international profile, and provides them with some money that they get from various governments to replace their boats, rebuild their engines, repair their nets, that kind of thing. And when we were going there, the organization asked for two boats, and 20 boats showed up to, to take us out into the Mediterranean Sea. And their stories were all the same. They wanted us to get their story out. They weren't interested as much in humanitarian aid or as in charity. They wanted the political message about what was happening to them in Gaza to get out to everybody. I want to just very quickly uh, talk about the farmers um, we went to uh, an area in the north area called Bin Hanun. That's closer than I normally am. Um, <laughs> which, which includes the buffer zone um, on the very uh, border of Israel. And the buffer zone is between 0.5 and 1 kilometer on the north and between 1.8 and 2.4 on the east. And 29% of the arable land of Gaza is taken by these buffer zones that are patrolled by the military. And so what you have is the labor force, the agricultural labor force has dropped from 12 to 7, 12.7, uh, sorry, to 7.4%. And the amount of food they're able to produce um, has dropped significantly. A total of 46% of the arable land is no longer usable between the buffer zone and the destruction of cast lead. So a lot of the work that the Union of Agriculture Work Committees do is trying to rehabilitate the land, get seeds, build wells, build irrigation dish ditches, um, get some publicity internationally. But it's very difficult to rehabilitate the land because the things you need to rehabilitate the land can't get through the border. They're part of the block list of things. So you're in this kind of catch-22. <clears throat> According to um, Save the Children, 50% of the respondents to a questionnaire who lived in the buffer zone have lost their li livelihood since 2002. 50% have lost their livelihood. 73% of all households in the buffer zone live below the poverty level. The average family in Gaza, because it's not just the farmers who are suffering, it's everybody in Gaza who's suffering, because the average family spends 56% of their income on food. I believe in Vancouver it's something like 20 or 25%, so a huge difference. So for the farmers, the continued existence on their land, and what you see um, is at, in the distance on the horizon electronic towers that are controlled by the Israelis that are programmed 
so that uh, their heat sensors detect anybody within those buffer zones, they're automatically shot. There's no human intervention. This is all automatic. So for the farmers trying to farm, trying to dodge the bullets, trying to survive, the mere fact that they are on their land is a profound act of resistance. You know, you have people that despite everything continue to go out, continue to try and grow their products. We visited, uh, you, you would have seen slides and at some point it will pop up. Um, pictures of the agricultural college which has been destroyed. It's very close to the buffer zone. It might be within the buffer zone. The farmer's family that we um, visited, his house was all shot up. You looked at one of the rooms in the house, the bedroom in the house. Okay, there's the, there is the house, his house. And in that top right-hand corner was the children's bedroom. And from another angle, you see these giant bullet and shell holes in, in the bedroom. And this is the, the farmer. And he also was shot uh, one day at, at tending his fields. And one of the places we visited um, was a developmental foundation in the actual town of Bet Hanun. And that had been taken over by the Israelis during cast lead and used as a sniper position to shoot people in, in the surrounding farmer areas. So the Union of Agriculture Work Committees spends their time then, as I described, helping with harvest, access to seeds, building irrigation dishes, and that kind of thing. So one other thing I just want to mention, and there's maybe one more picture. That's the Agricultural College. Um, we, I have, don't have time to go into this, but we did meet with a number of trade unionists in Gaza, and Cup W had given me a letter of solidarity to take with me and their banner. So here are a number of the uh, um, active unionists in, in Gaza. Uh, this is, he's involved in the Democratic Teachers Union, and this was our, the fellow in the blue shirt on the left was our host, and he's also a grade eight teacher. So their message, again, was the same. We don't have, hear from um, any unions in North America. We don't get any support from unions in North America. So I wrote to one of my friends, very active in the trade union movement, what can we do about this? And he said he didn't know of any unions in British Columbia supporting unionists in the West Bank and Gaza. And he recommended to me a detective fiction series set in Gaza with a teacher as a as the central character. So not taken too seriously. So finally, as a delegation, we were overwhelmed with what was happening to the fishers and the farmers. And we determined that when we came back, one of the things we wanted to focus on as a delegation was drawing attention to this. So what we have decided to do is in conjunction with the uh, Agriculture Work Committee in Gaza, is on September the 30th, we're going to organize a cross Canada series of demonstrations to focus public attention on what's happening there. Because the act of visiting Gaza is an act of agreeing to be in solidarity with the people of Gaza and to help build and support their resistance. And this is one of our first actions in that regard. Thank you. way the rules are, I now introduce Jace. <laughs> Jace was a videographer. He works in the film industry in BC when he needs to make money, but almost all of his time for a long, long time has been spent doing documentaries on issues related to Palestine. He was our trip videographer, and uh, he stayed for two weeks after we were there. So he's going to be showing us about six minutes a video that he took, I think mainly of the fishing, but I'm not sure, and then talk about his experiences in the 12 days after the delegation left. Jace?
So as, uh, as Brian was saying, I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, stay beyond uh, an additional two weeks. I had been to, uh, to Gaza once before in, uh, in 2009 and, and had only been able to, to be there for 24 hours on that trip. And I thought to myself, well, between the eight days with the delegation and then another, another two weeks, uh, that would be... Um, that would be a, a wonderfully long trip. And uh, it took about two days of being there to realize that it was going to be nowhere near enough. I, I wish I was still there. So before I, I get into, uh, into uh, um, a verbal presentation, I'd just like to show you a video that, uh, that I shot uh, after the delegation left. Uh, myself and uh, two other internationals went out on a fishing boat. One of these people, uh, Asma, a woman from, uh, from Belgium, I had known her previously the year before when we were in, uh, in Greece with the, um, the flotilla that, uh, that never set sail. So um, I'm going to play this and uh, then I'll uh, have a few, uh, a few comments about the video as well as, uh, as a few other things to say. We had, um, in order to be able to go on the fishing boat, we had to, uh, had to receive uh, official permission from the, uh, from the Hamas government, and that meant going down a few days beforehand, um, giving in our passports and, and, and receiving uh, written authorization. Part of the agreement uh, that we had around doing that was that we would, that the fishing boats, they go out for about 12 hours. And that particular day, the boat left at about maybe 3 p.m., something like that. The, the agreement that we had was that we would stay on the boat for about two to three hours, which is probably roughly what ended up happening. We were picked up by uh, a smaller boat and taken back to shore. Um, and then that boat subsequently went out again. And while I can't give you any specific details about what happened that night, I think it was about two or three days later, there was a, uh, a rally and protest for the fishermen that was held down at the port. And I did go to that, and I did see uh, the fishermen. And uh, the language barrier wouldn't really allow a conversation, but he, uh, he obviously was fine and, and didn't, uh, didn't make mention of any, any further encounters with the, with the Israeli Navy. So I'm going to uh, try now to, uh, to move on and, and, and try to, uh, well, originally I was going to produce a video that was going to be a, a summary of my additional two weeks. And I soon realized, well, how does one possibly do that? And then I was going to try and talk about that. And I realized more or less the same thing. So um, and some of what I was going to say has actually already been covered by Brian, so I'm going to try and think on my feet and not, to, and not be repetitive. I also will make a few general comments and then, uh, and then also um, talk a little bit about uh, an interview I did with uh, Khalil um, uh, Shaheen from the Palestinian uh, Center for Human Rights. One of the things that struck me the most about spending the time in Gaza, and, and particularly the, the additional two weeks, being a, a foreigner, a Caucasian who was there um, with a friend that I have, someone actually um, who I had known uh, via the internet for a year and a half, and who now I finally had met in person. I stayed with Mohammed for the, for the remaining two weeks. One of the, the biggest thing that struck me was the generosity of, of people in Gaza. And, and certainly, as someone white, you do stand out. And people, want, and people notice you, and, and people want to talk to you. Um, I was sitting uh, basically on a, on a planter one day, waiting to meet with Asma, the woman who I went out on the fishing boat with. And these two young boys who were probably 10, maybe 12, uh, were sitting, you know, 15 feet away. And they immediately invited me to sit on the, on the additional chair that was, that was next to them. We were given pins, a uh, little Palestinian flag, which I had on my lapel. I meant to bring it tonight, but I, I forgot. 
and it had turned upside down. And one of these young guys, they, he noticed it, and he turned it right side up. But in the process of doing that, the actual flag broke off the pin. So he was a little chagrined, but um, before I knew it, uh, I mean, he didn't speak any English. I don't speak any, any Arabic, maybe half a dozen words. Um, I heard him say something like, one shekel. And, uh, and point to across the street. And I put two and two together and realized that he was going to go across the street and in some way or another fix it. He did that. He got some crazy glue. I offered him the shekel because I didn't feel I wanted him to pay for it. He refused to take it. And that was one of a number of very small incidents that uh, encounters that I had with people in, in different ways who just... They wanted connection, and it was always done with a, with a spirit of, of generosity. So the interview I did uh, with uh, Khalil, he is the, uh, the head of the um, Economic and, and Social Development Unit uh, at the Palestinian Center for, uh, for Human Rights. And while that is based in, in the Gaza Strip, it does uh, deal with issues um, with all, within all of Palestine. One of the things that he talked to, about was uh, the lack of freedom of movement, but not only the lack of freedom of movement within Gaza or, 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 or the, the ability to leave Gaza, but of course the, the lack of freedom of movement within the West Bank, Bank itself and the ability for people to go to, uh, to the West Bank from Gaza. He himself has been, uh, he actually had to give up a master's degree, yeah, pursuing a master's degree uh, in the late 90s because he was no longer allowed back into, uh, into East Jerusalem or, the, or the, the West Bank. The reason, he was deemed a security risk. He was never told specifically why he was, uh, why he was deemed a security risk. And um, this is the situation that, that all people in Gaza are faced with if, uh, if they want to, uh, to go and visit relatives or friends uh, in, in other parts of Palestine. This young man that I was referring to a moment ago, uh, who I stayed with for two weeks, um, back in about, well, the end of, I guess, 2011, he had the opportunity to go to do a program, a leadership program for young people in, in, in Britain. He, um, it was a, a program that was offered by an organization called British Arab Exchanges. And we talked a lot about how he was going to make that possible. It wasn't a question of finances in terms of, of getting there or in being there. That was all covered. It was a question that simply to get a visa, if in fact he was going to be able to get a visa, he had to put down $2,000 and have it in his account and leave it in his account long enough, perhaps up to a month, in order for him to, uh, to be granted a visa. He was able to do that. And now, he, again, he's been accepted to a university to, to do some postgraduate work at a university in Sweden. And um, he's going to be facing the same thing. He's currently working for the World Bank. Doing, uh, he's also a filmmaker, um, doing uh, a variety of projects on, um, on poverty-related issues that are, are, are within Gaza. The World Bank, even as it pays him, from what I can gather, a fairly reasonable wage, the amount of time that, he has, that it takes to actually get this money, um, he frequently has to go out and take other work if he's <laughs> able to get it. And as a result, sometimes he has to turn down what he's really capable of doing. OK. so. Moving on to my, more of the conversation I had uh, with Halil, more than $17 billion has been lost to the economy in Gaza since the beginning 
of the siege. And these aren't statistics that have been compiled by Palestinians. These are statistics that have been, uh, been uh, compiled by, by international bodies. The freedom of movement, both for people and for goods, are, are uh, one of the main obstacles to this. Um, for example, um, one of the things that, uh, that I learned while I was there, that even to export strawberries, something as innocuous as strawberries, to the West Bank, never mind Europe, as is often done, it's, um, and actually I got an email, I think it was yesterday, from, um, from the organization Geisha, which is launching a campaign to try and make it possible. Strawberries and flowers, which are a main export uh, from Gaza, are frequently fed to animals because uh, if they aren't fed to the animals, they'll simply rot. As, uh, as the video told you, uh, fishermen have lost 85% of their income. In June of this year alone, there were uh, 35 attacks on, um, on fishermen. And what I, what I should also say about, um, about the video is that the young boy who you saw sitting on the, on the boat where you see the, the Israeli uh, ship in the background, at one point after we had been asked to put our cameras away and, and, and the Israeli boat was very close to us at that point, much closer than, than what you saw in the video, he was kind of going like that to them, like, what are you doing? I mean, he was possibly saying that in Arabic, but that was certainly his gesture. It's like, what are you doing? Are you nuts? Because, I mean, I put the camera away when, when uh, once we were asked to. So what you saw there of the boat and you heard the gunfire, I mean, that, that was a shot that I took beforehand and those were actually sound effects, to be perfectly out front about it. But it is a, a reasonable, um, uh, representation of what actually happened, except, the, except that the boat was much closer. The boat lost its steering, as, as, as you saw in the video, and the Israeli Navy was informed of that, and at that point, that is when the gunfire increased. Anyway, I meant to say that before, so there it is now. Okay, in terms of, of imports and export, exports, one third of Gaza's daily needs are brought in through the tunnels. Exports um, outside of Gaza are virtually non-existent and when they happen, they, they are at the whim of, uh, of Israel. Compounding uh, the, the economic development of, of Gaza is, of course, the destruction of infrastructure, ranging, okay, I will, I have to wrap it up very quickly. <laughs> uh, let's see, how do we do that? Okay, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just gonna move right along really quickly. I'm actually gonna cut that. And I just wanna talk very quickly about a conversation that I had with, um, both uh, Khalil and also another interview that I did, which hopefully in time we'll see the light of day, talking about Canada and Canada's relationship to, the, uh, to Israel and, and, and hence to, uh, to Palestine. Uh, it seemed to me that people were very much aware of uh, our current government's uh, Zionist position, which in one way, of course, that's uh, very depressing. On the other hand, I personally like the fact that people seem to, to realize well, the, that, that, uh, that they saw beyond the myth that Canada has about itself of being a supporter of, uh, of human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, probably the biggest thing, and then, I'll, and then I will stop, that, uh, that Halil said, or, or the thing that comes to mind right now, thinking on my feet, um, is... Um, even from the point of view, and this is his statement, even from the point of view of Canadians' self-interest, the Canadian government is complicit with the oppression and the, injust and the injustice that is happening in Palestine. And within its complicity, then the Canadian government essentially pays uh, with uh, various forms of aid. Yes, we know that uh, a lot of aid has stopped to Gaza in particular, 
but it's a double standard. It's a, it, it's a, it's a hypocritical position that, um, that, uh, that the Canadian government is taking. And from pe many people that I spoke to in Gaza, they are well aware of this. So that, for me, is um, inspiration to uh, try and address that. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Martha Roberts. Martha is a, a registered midwife and community health organizer in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, she has been working as a community organizer for social and economic justice for more than 20 years, working with Lakena, uh, Coffee House Collective, the Poverty Action Network, Grassroots Women, and um, I could read this whole paragraph, but I think that gives you a pretty good idea of what she's all about, so I'm going to turn it over to Martha. Hi. I just wanted to add to my embarrassingly long bio that Jace thankfully didn't read, that my current organization that I work with is the Alliance for People's Health, and we're an organization of progressive health workers and community organizers who um, would like to tackle the roots of ill health and not just health on the surface. And so it was with the Alliance for People's Health that Ianis and I traveled to Gaza. Um, I have eight minutes and I'm going to try very quickly to touch on some important points that I learned as a registered midwife and a health worker about the health situation in Gaza as well as talking about the uh, women's liberation movement in Palestine. So just, there are so many rich resources on health under occupation available. Um, I'm just going to touch on some things I think stand out as important. And the first thing is, this is a picture of uh, our baby Jimmy with some of the kids at the Shadi or um, beach camp, refugee camp. That 40% of the population of Gaza is under 14, or 14 and under. And so that's a very large proportion of the population to be youth and children. And that has particular implications for the occupation and the lasting impacts of Israeli aggression on Palestine. And what we saw, and this is a picture um, of a young boy, and his, injury aren't, his injuries aren't very obvious now, but his face was injured. Um, he was one of the youth that was inside Al Fahura, the UNRWA school that was hit by an Israeli shell during Cast Lead. But you can see definitely. Sorry, it's very emotional for me still. So I'm going to be teary and choked up. But um, you can really see this. This picture really spoke to me because you can really see the emotion in these kids' eyes and the lasting effect that these kids are going to live with. And I think Kathy's going to talk about the situation for the teachers. Um, so I don't want to touch on this too much. <laughs> but um, the acute psychological stress and the psychological trauma that comes not only from the occupation itself, but the chronic deprivation that these kids are living under is a major health struggle. And then, of course, there's the challenges that are of particular nature. And so this is a picture of a girl in a wheelchair here, and his father was pleading with us, could you please help me get my daughter out of Gaza to, get, seek, me to seek medical aid? And of course, we were there as political solidarity activists and were unable to provide the aid, but th this is just a microcosm of the overall struggle of the health sector. You know, they have the capacity to deal with most cases, but in particular cases, people need to leave and they're unable to travel. And then, of course, there are the, the medical facilities that are operated by the progressive health sector, which on a day-to-day -day basis are able to deal with, as I said, the majority of cases. But in situations like cast lead, when there are multiple casualties, of course, the hospitals are overrun with casualties. And then the ongoing health needs, in particular for pregnant women, then they're kind of out of necessity pushed to the side as the trauma casualties are dealt with. So at, at moments, there are these escalations of health needs that the, that the health sector is unable to deal with that capacity. So this is a picture of Kathy taking a picture of the kids in the camp. And I think it's a good image of kind of what day-to-day -day life is like for kids in Gaza. And at the Alliance for People's Health, we analyze that there are diseases of the body 
but there are also diseases of imperialism. Oh, it's okay. I can talk. Just the diseases of plunder, of unjust trade, of worker exploitation, and diseases of occupation. Um, so we analyze that as the health sector, we can't be neutral. Basically, we don't, we don't believe that health organizations can be neutral. So if you go in as the Red Cross and you say that we're a neutral organization, what you actually end up doing is a tacit or implicit uh, support for Israeli occupation because you actually have to take a stand as health workers to, to, um, to provide health services in the way that people need. And so we have this double um, analysis that the health sector needs to actually participate in the movement for social justice and on the flip side the movement for social justice needs to include health as one of the things on their agenda so it's a, it's a double analysis and what we saw was that the Union of Health Work Committees in Gaza actually takes up that two-pronged struggle so they encourage the health sector to be involved in the movement for justice and the movement for the liberation of Palestine and on the flip side they provide health services within the context of that movement in a way that I think is very important um, for Canadians to know about, that it, it's not a neutral position, it's a position on the side of, of the movement for liberation in Palestine, which is very different from many of the other NGOs that operate in the area. And they provide health services in the framework of what we call the Alliance for People's Health, a people's institution, which means that they attempt to include democratic participation in the organization through the provision of these health services. They operate five primary care clinics, four youth centers, which I think is also re in recognition of the fact that 40% of the population are youth or children. Um, they operate this major tertiary hospital, Al Auda, or return hospital, uh, which is a major institution with three buildings. And I think another testimony to their strength is that 70% of their workforce is, is women. So in a context where only 12% of women are able to have employment outside of the home, 70% of the workforce in the Union of Health Work Committees is women. And they uh, explicitly provide services to the most marginalized populations. So that was my sum up of the health sector in hopefully slightly more than four minutes. And then there's the situation for women. And there's an article in the May 2005 edition of Monthly Review um, by the author. Her name is Susan Mudadi Daraj. She writes an article called Palestinian Women Fighting Two Battles. And her analysis is that women, the women's movement in Palestine faces two challenges. The first challenge is the liberation of Palestine from Israeli occupation. And then the second challenge is women's liberation from patriarchy, which is one of the fundamental tenets of the women's movement. And there's also an article um, by Comrade Parvati from the Communist Party of Nepal Maoist. And she breaks that down further and she says that the women's movement faces three challenges. The women participating in the struggle for national and social liberation. And then she breaks patriarchy down further. The struggle to advance women's leadership in the left and then women's own internal struggle to fight patriarchy and internalized chauvinism, male chauvinism within themselves. And that includes internalized sexism and the internalization of oppressive social norms. And I think that the stories that we heard from the two women's organizations that we met with reflect Palestinian women's ability to face that three-front struggle and to really take on that challenge successfully. So the first organization we met with was the Palestinian Developmental Women's Studies Association, um, which is an organization that seeks to support, empower, and build women's liberation or the women's movement in Palestine. And through this association, we were able to hear the stories of women political prisoners, which I found very moving. I think it was one of, for me, the most emotional mornings of our trip. We were able to hear women's stories directly, their own personal experiences of being arrested, physically defending their homes from, from destruction by um, bulldozers, from um, being arrested, from having babies torn from their arms, from being sexually assaulted, from being tortured um, and detained, and fearing for the lives of their children. So having Israeli soldiers tell them, we're gonna murder your children if you don't um, say what we want you to say, or to hear that their husbands or their sons had been detained and or killed. Um, and 
I think our other, my other presenters have said the messages that they heard that one, that the organizations requested that we share. And from the Palestinian um, Developmental Women's Studies Association, the women who shared with us that morning said they had two messages that they wanted us to share. The first message, let's see, I'm gonna cry again. <laughs> I can't say this, it just sticks in my throat. The first message was that to decry the lie that Palestinian women don't love their children. So you see these images on the media of, of um, young men who are engaged in violent activity and, and people say, well, how can Palestinian women let their sons do this? And what they were saying was, well, actually, unless you're in our situation, how can you judge and what other choice do we have? Um, And here I quote the woman who's um, speaking. She said, why is our resistance illegal? Who is violating international law? And so I was very moved by that. And the second message they had, which is similar to what Jace was saying, and oh, it's waving the one minute in my face, and I'm actually almost done, <laughs> was that they also requested that we hold the Canadian government accountable for their relationship with Israel. This is my last slide, so there we go. So we also were able to meet with the Union of Palestinian Women's Committees, and I think they were the best example of how Palestinian women face those three fronts that women who are engaged in the women's liberation movement must face. And they bravely struggle to increase women's per political participation in the movement as a whole. And in particular, they provide training for women to develop themselves as political leaders on the left, and then finally, they provide workshops and trainings in women's homes so they can become economically independent, which is really important for women in particular who end up at the, as the head of households when men are uh, arrested or detained or killed. Um, and I think the success of the efforts of the, of the women's committees is their financial sustainability. And through the selling of their textile arts and food, they actually managed to be a financially self self-supporting organization, which I think in the context of the siege is a real victory for the women's movement. And the message that we got from the women's committees was that the greatest threat to Palestinian women is not patriarchy within Palestinian society, but in fact is, is the Israeli occupation itself. to mention that Medical Aid for Palestinians, um, which is a UK-based NGO, published a series of articles in the 2009 Lancet on health in the occupied Palestinian territory. So if you wanted more information on Palestinian health, it's, it's a fairly reasonable series of articles. And I'm supposed to introduce Kathy. So Kathy Kopp's active support for Palestinian rights goes back to her early days, uh, her student days in the 1970s. She's currently a member of BEAC, or the Boycott Israeli Apartheid Campaign, and the Seriously Free Speech Committee. Recently retired after a 35-year teaching career in BC schools, she is committed to the protection of public education in this province and the fundamental right to access to education around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Um, so great to see so many familiar faces here tonight. I think we should, I think you can see from the previous delegates and their, their talks just how inspired we were despite all of the incredible yeah. challenges that the Palestinian uh, people face. We were so inspired by the people that we met with. Um, I I'd just like to share with you though one of the first encounters we had was when we came through the tunnels. Um, my, my son was with us, he's, he's the ninth delegate, he's a member of the uh, Environmental Youth Alliance and he's in Nairobi right now, he won't be here till Friday, so there were nine of us. Um, my son and I came through the tunnel, we, we had no idea, I mean we hadn't been through the Gaza tunnels before, and when we came out the first person that we met sort of said, I mean jumped up and said, don't worry, you're in Gaza. <laughs> so um, it, it was very reassuring. Um, <laughs> So with that, I'd like to actually start um, with a message that um, the delegates received when we met with the principal um, at the Al-Fahura School, um, the UN um, 
boys' uh, middle school that I think, um, uh, J no, who was it? I think Martha mentioned that already. It was one of the schools that was bombed during the um, cast lead. And uh, that's where we met the principal. But initially, when we arrived that day, it was a really happy occasion because the students had um, gone back to school to pick up their report cards. It was the last day, and they had a long holiday ahead of them. So they were as jubilant as students anywhere. So were the teachers. This is a picture of Mr. Bessem Sala and his students. Um, so initially, this was a very familiar scene to me. As you heard, I've had 35 years uh, experience saying goodbye to students in June <laughs> and hello to them in September. But um, after Mr. Uh, Sala took us to his classroom, anything to do with familiarity that I had ever experienced as a teacher ended there when he gave us an, uh, an account of the um, unforg uh, unforgettable, unforgivable cruelty that was um, inflicted on the schools in Gaza during the uh, Israeli bombing. Even though uh, the IDF had been given the exact coordinates of all of the schools in Gaza, 280 of them had been bombed. Um, in, in Mr. Salah's uh, school, the United Nations uh, school, the al Fahur that we're talking about here and picture, um, 2,700 people from the neighborhood took refuge during the three weeks of cast lead. In Mr. Uh, Salah's classroom alone, uh, 80 of his students and their families took refuge from the bombs and from the, um, uh, the bombs and the uh, uh, white phosphorus. So during that time, I mean, they were in a classroom with no light, no heat. The windows had been blown out. One entire wing of the school was destroyed. So was the library. Uh, 46 uh, pe uh, uh, people were killed in that school during the three weeks. Five of them were children. In Mr. Salah's classroom alone, three of his students died. I'm going to, um, I've been practicing saying this because each time I say it, it it's so difficult. But. Um, Three of his students left, and when they were out in the, uh, left the school uh, one afternoon to go and buy something, and when they were out in the street, and four Israeli mortars slammed into the street, and uh, they, they died. So um, Mr. Salah then was faced, when, once the schools reopened, he was faced with the uh, unfor uh, unbelievable task of how to deal with the loss of their classmates when, when he had his classroom back. So I think the next slide is uh, his attempt to, the, the three boys just coincidentally sat in a row, and those are their names on the desk, and you can see the grim faces of the students. So Mr. Salah had to devise a curriculum that would somehow deal with the emotional wounds that not only his students faced, but their families as well. And um, he, was, he decided that he would totally revamp his curriculum. He invited the families into the school, into his classroom. And they, for the next while, they, they, they experienced drama and um, sports, festivals, conflict resolution in a way of, of uh, trying to deal with these wounds and heal them a little bit. And after a period of time, eventually, students were able to open up and talk about their feelings and their experiences, and were slowly on their on their um, you know on a road to healing, which of course will take decades or forever. Um, although Mr. Salah's heroic ded dedication is incredibly inspiring, it wasn't at all unique in terms of what uh, the people of Gaza do for each other in terms of their commitment to for care and support and also for their commitment to uh, you know, the ongoing struggle to free Palestine. But just during the uh, cast lead operation, I mentioned 280 schools were destroyed, uh, were damaged, 18 were destroyed. Six universities and colleges were destroyed and seven were damaged. 164 students were killed and 454 were injured. 12 teachers were killed and five were injured. But as we know, although the cast lead assault was brutal, it certainly, um, uh, the IDF killing of children in Israel and uh, in Palestine, sorry, is nothing new. And since uh, 2002, the second intifada, uh, in Gaza alone, 685 children have been killed by Israeli forces. So uh, we've been hearing tonight that there are so many challenges uh, facing the people of Gaza for the schools. I'm, I'm going to mention a little bit about the schools and the youth. 
um, not only because of the aftermath of Cass Lead, but also because of the ongoing siege. One of the, th one of the many challenges facing the schools is the <coughs> lack of resources. Because of the uh, blockade, it severely limits ac uh, essential educational materials like books and uh, science equipment. Uh, but on a positive note, just recently, the Islamic Re uh, University graduated its second uh, class of medical students, which I think is an incredible uh, victory considering that their school had been bombed and parts of it had never been rebuilt and they were able to graduate without the use of any science classrooms or labs. So the fact that they've been able to do this I think is an incredible victory. Um, there are severe limits to higher education. The illegal closure of Gaza from land, sea and air uh, fundamentally violates students' access to uh, to freedom of movement and education. According to the Israeli Supreme Court, Palestinian students are, a dangerous, are in the dangerous category and so are systematically denied um, study permits for universities in the West Bank or um, abroad. So this puts an incredible pressure on the universities of Gaza. Uh, a lot of students do not have access to them because there's limited enrollment. Unfortunately, job opportunities are also uh, limited. Uh, in the 15 to 19 age category, there's 72% unemployment rate, and for 20-year-olds 20, 20 to 24, it's 66%. Uh, so the reality of Gaza as a rapidly growing population deprived of education and job opportunities facing ongoing poverty and alienation. But as I said, despite all of that grim information, the spirit of the Gaza people is truly inspiring. Um, I mentioned overcrowding in the universities. It's also a problem in the uh, secondary and the elementary schools. Uh, about 43% of students go to UN schools. The rest go to government and uh, private schools, uh, which most of the schools are on a, a shift where some, have, some go in the morning and some go in the afternoon. Class sizes are 40, about 45 to 50 students per class. And because of Israeli's prohibition on construction materials, it has uh, now, because of the tunnels, it's, it's helping, but um, it's so difficult to repair the schools that were damaged during cast lead or even to do the, the uh, renovating of the wear and tear, you know, the just irregular wear and tear on schools. Um, according to the Ministry of Education in the 2011-2012 uh, year, last year, 40,000 uh, children of Gaza were denied access to public education because there weren't enough classrooms for them. They're missing at least 1,000 classrooms, and they can't, they, I think, I think they uh, have a permit for three new schools, which is hardly going to solve it. Um, Brian and um, Jace both mentioned the buffer zones. 40, uh, that, that's the, um, the restricted border area, um, like where the farmers and the fishers and people do not have, uh, are frequently bombarded by Israeli fire. Well, unfortunately, 44,000 uh, students have uh, go to school in these areas, and uh, the fear, uncertainty, the um, evacuations, damage to schools, and the ongoing stress, you can imagine what effect that does, uh, has on students' ability to learn and their um, overall coping with academic uh, challenges. Um, 80% of Palestinians have experienced trauma as a result of losing a parent or a close family member. Uh, they've often witnessed um, brutal violence. They know that their homes, their neighborhoods, their schools are not safe and that often adults are not going to be able to protect them. Um, sometimes parents are vulnerable themselves because of the challenges that they have to face. Also, health wise, they have, there's uh, an ongoing iodine deficiency, uh, anemia, vitamin D deficiency, so, oh my god, so <laughs> these are all challenges that students face in terms of their academic ability. Um, I, I quickly, um, there, there are so many organizations in Gaza uh, to support the, the, um, the uh, students and their families. Um, the Hassan Kafani Development Center. It was one of the ones that we folk, that we visited, and their their um, goal is to try to put smiles back on the faces of the children of Gaza. I, oh, this is what this was a poster in um, Mr. Salah's classroom um, uh, about the the job of the elected student council. And uh, just briefly, I think number seven says um, their responsibility is to strengthen the spirit of love and forgiveness among students. So I don't have time to go over those rules, but this is 
a picture of um, one of the community centers that is focused so dedicatedly, usually through volunteers to help children and, and women and families um, adopt orphans, raise money. Um, there's so much to say. We've run out, I've run out of time, but um, I just want to let everybody know that I think it's obvious that we are really inspired by what we, the people that we met in Gaza. I just wanted to quickly end with a request from a member of the Palestinian Democratic Party to us, and I'd like to pass it on to you. He said, with your voices, your pens, and your cameras, please carry the message of the Palestinian people to the world. And today we'd like you to join us in that struggle because that's, that's what we feel like has to be done, especially to our government and as we've been talking about their complicity in um, the ongoing occupation of Palestine. Thank you. We still have a few more reports to go, so um, please stay tuned. You've already been hearing about so many of the amazing organizations that we met with during our trip to Palestine. Um, my name is Charlotte Cates. I'm a Palestine solidarity activist. I work with the Boycott Israeli Apartheid Campaign and the Samadun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network, as well as a number of other movements and organizations. And I was one of the members of the Vancouver delegation to Gaza as well. Um, you've heard about the Union of Health Work Committees, the Union of Agricultural Work Committees, the Union of Palestinian Women's Committees. You've heard about the Palestinian uh, Developmental Women's Studies Association, which organizes Palestinian women prisoners. And these organizations are grassroots mass organizations that are built by Palestinians in Gaza, supporting Palestinians in Gaza, not just providing charity or providing aid, but being part of the struggle for the liberation of Palestine, being a part of organizing people who are fishing, who are farming, who are women in their communities, who are going to school, um, students that are part of student organizations, who are demanding free education on campuses in Palestine, just like people, just like students are in the streets demanding here as well. Um, these organizations don't just need our visits, and they certainly don't need our charity, but they do need our solidarity. Um, I work here with the Samadun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network, and I also work with the Campaign to Free Ahmed Sadat. And so I do organizing and work around the struggle of Palestinian political prisoners. And one of the things that we certainly experienced in Gaza on this delegation um, really drove home the statistics that we hear about Palestinians and political imprisonment and the mass imprisonment um, of Palestinians that's done by the Israeli regime. We hear the statistics that you know one out of four Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza have been imprisoned, that that number rises to 40% when we're talking about men. But it really hits home when in every single meeting you attend, from a meeting with doctors, to a meeting with farmers, to a meeting with women's organizers, to a student and youth organizing meeting, a good percentage of the room can go around and tell stories about their time in Israeli prison and Israeli detention. That this is a common experience, far from being an experience that's shared only on the margins of society, political imprisonment is a commonality um, that we've seen in Palestine and we saw, certainly saw in Gaza um, that goes not just um, among women and men, but also across generations. Because one of the things that we did see in Gaza was that resisted, just like the population of Gaza, the resistance of Gaza and the resistance of Palestine is a resistance that spans generations. Um, we met, when we went to the Palestinian Developmental Women's Studies Association, women who had been arrested in 1967, in 1968, in 1969, in the first years that Gaza was uh, in the first years that Gaza was under the first years that Gaza was under Israeli occupation. And we know that the laws that were used against these women were laws that had been developed when the first part of Palestine was occupied in 1948 and used against Palestinians there and were then transferred to be used against Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza in 1967. The women who we met and shared their stories um, were elders in many ways. These were people who had some of them had seen the Nakba, some of them had been refugees themselves, some of them had seen refugees come to Gaza. Some of them had been arrested weeks, months, and years 
after the Israelis came to Gaza defending, for defending their homes, for defending their land, or simply for providing food, sustenance, and support to their sons, their daughters, their children, and their children's friends um, who were taking part in the resistance. Um, because one thing that you know, we hear about Gaza now, we hear about Gaza and we hear about resistance, and we see people's resilience despite everything. We see the fact that a population that was placed under siege has created an amazing and interconnected system of tunnels in order to keep its economy alive, despite having some of the most powerful governments and militaries in the world arrayed against it. We see a population that, is, that works to engage in resistance and remaining on its land and remaining steadfast despite all odds and despite everything that, that, that comes against it. And so what we, we heard from these women um, was, much the same, was much the same story. They were incredibly proud not only of their resistance but of the resistance of their children just as much as they felt sorrow and anger at the experience of having their children seized from them. And so resistance in Gaza isn't a phenomenon that developed with missiles last year or two years ago or in 2005. Um, it, was in, it was in the 1960s and the 1970s that um, someone who was known as Javara Gaza, the, the Che Guevara of Gaza, Muhammad al-Aswad, was said by the Israelis to rule the streets of Gaza at night. And so Gaza has always been a center for resistance, just as all of Palestine has been a center for resistance. And these women were veterans of, the, of that era. Um, later in the delegation, we actually went with some uh, of the activists that were hosting us to lay a wreath on Javara Gaza's grave and express our solidarity there. And this, again, was another, was, as Martha said, an incredibly emotional meeting and also an opportunity, really, to hear not just from women telling their stories of, of horror at being stripped from their children by the Israeli occupation and placed in prison, um, but also their stories of being some of the first people who engaged in resistance against the occupation of Palestine. And so when we see the images of these women, we're not just seeing the images of victims of occupation. We're seeing the heroes and heroines of resistance who continue to inspire the resistance that lives in Gaza today. Um, and, and this wasn't the only meeting that we had with former Palestinian prisoners. Um, we had another meeting. Um, mostly with uh, men who were former prisoners and who were younger, the vast majority of whom were released in October 2011 as part of what was known as the Shalit deal or the prisoner exchange deal. Um, there were a 1,000 prisoners who were released at that time. The man that you see speaking here is Alam Kabi. Now, interestingly, he's someone who was displaced to Gaza. He's from the West Bank. That's where he was born. But this wasn't his first displacement. When he was in the West Bank, it's because his families were refugees from 1948 who were displaced there during the Nakba by Israel. And so this is someone who's been displaced at least twice by Zionist occupation and colonization of Palestine. And he's been, he was displaced to Gaza as part of the prisoner deal. He's still in Palestine. He's still continuing to resist. And just like his uh, fellow prisoners from elsewhere in Palestine who were displaced to Gaza, he feels as if he's been welcomed in Gaza, that the people of Gaza have, have welcomed him with celebrations, with joy, with love. But at the same time, he's separated from his family, from his home, from everything he's ever known. And even that is compounded by a desire, just like 80% of the people of Gaza who are refugees, to return back to their original homes and lands that were stolen from them in Palestine in 1948. Um, and the prisoners that we met this ni that night spoke about their experiences. Um, they spoke about being part of the hunger strikes that started this current wave of hunger strikes that's continuing to go on in September to October 2011. Um, they talked about the horrible medical care, or lack of medical care, maybe the more appropriate term, that they receive in the prison hospitals. Uh, one man was misdiagnosed countless times before he started finally getting better after he started rejecting treatment from the prison hospitals altogether. Um, you know, one man who, these, these men who we met with that night went around the room and they told us their sentences and the amount of time they'd sent in prison. And really the numbers just rang out. Life sentence, spent 19 years in prison. 30-year sentence, spent 19 years in prison. 12 years in prison, eight years in prison. 
25-year sentences, multiple life sentences. And these were people who were committed to standing for the liberation of Palestine. They were political people who were part of the struggle to liberate their land and who continue to be political people who are part of the struggle to liberate their land today. Um, at the same time, they've put a priority on working with their fellow former prisoners to support people who are still inside Israeli prisons. There are still uh, over 4,700 Palestinian prisoners inside Israeli jails. We all know about the hunger strikes that took place in April to May, uh, 2000, in April to May of this year. Um, there's still Palestinian prisoners on hunger strike. One man, Akram al Rakawi, who's himself from Gaza, is on his 102nd day of hunger strike today. Akram al-Rakawi is suffering from diabetes, kidney problems. Um, he's suffering from an extreme lack of medical care. And he's, he's calling for an early release. He's scheduled to be released in 2013. And despite the fact that he has 13 children at home to care for and is in, severe, and is in a severe medical crisis, um, the Israeli occupation won't release him. One thing that we did have the opportunity to participate in while we were in Gaza um, actually was on the last day of the hunger strike of Mahmoud Sarsak, the Palestinian national soccer team player who achieved victory in his hunger strike and was finally freed in Gaza on July 10th um, after 96 days of hunger strike. He'd been held without charge or trial for over three years under what's called the unlawful combatant law. It's a form of administrative detention specifically applied to Palestinians from Gaza and therefore wasn't covered at all in the uh, agreement that was made to end the hunger strike. He had no choice but to continue to starve himself for his freedom. Um, Khalid uh, spoke at that tent. He was grabbed as soon as we got there and started to speak in Arabic um, to people about the struggle of Palestinian prisoners. And one of the other people that was there was Hina Shalabi, one of the former hunger strikers who was also um, displaced to Gaza when she was released. And we had the opportunity to participate in part of this ongoing day-to-day -day struggle. And what we saw throughout the hunger strikes that took place in April to May of this year was that the men who had been released and the women who, of the elder generation and the women who continue to be, who continue to be released from prison, as we see Hanas Shalabi here, um, participated every day in going to the tents in solidarity. They went on hunger strike again. They relived their prison hunger strikes in solidarity with the men and women who are still behind bars, who are, straight, who are starving for freedom and struggling for their rights. And just before I close, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, to specifically draw attention again, as some of my fellow delegates have done, to the role of the Canadian government in what's going on. Um, one of the former prisoners that we met, Imad, uh, the man who had been subject to such terrible uh, medical maltreatment in the prison hospital, uh, specifically said, you're here as Canadians. We know what your government is doing. We know that the Harper government is out there saying that, that Canada is Israel's best friend. Go back home and do something about what your government is doing. And so that's really a call to action for all of us, from someone who spent decades in an Israeli prison to come out and say the Canadian government needs to, needs to stop what it's doing, that it's a full-fledged participant in the siege on Gaza, and it's something that needs to stop now. And specifically, the Canadian government has attacked Palestinian prisoners and their supporters. Uh, one Palestinian community organization in Toronto, Palestine House, was recently defunded for its immigration settlement services um, by uh, Jason Kenney. And <laughs> Um, the you know minister of deportation and racism uh, who uh, is who has uh, who d declared that Palestine House could not receive funding anymore because of its uh, its connection to quote unquote Palestinian extremism and the example that they provided was a celebration of the release of terrorists in October 2011 and what they were talking about was a celebration to welcome back to the community and was celebrated by Palestinians here in Canada as well as Palestinians everywhere else around the world. Um, you'll be hearing more about how Palestinians are everywhere in the world and not just in Gaza and not just in the West Bank. Um, that this in itself was an example of supporting terrorism. It was a danger that needed to be wiped out. Support, staying that Palestine, celebrating the fact that men who had been, and women who had been unjustly arrested, who had lost years of their life to occupation prisons, were free now, was extremism. 
And so it's just an example of the practices and policies of the Canadian government that are targeting Palestinians and Arabs, not only in Palestine, but also here, and why we need to struggle um, in solidarity with Palestinian prisoners, but also to stop the actions of our government here as well. And so with that, I just wanted to introduce our next speaker, Ayanis Ormand, um, who's also with the Alliance for People's Health, the International League for People's Struggles, and a longtime activist for Palestine, for justice, and for liberation everywhere around the world. And with that, um, welcome Ayanis. Thank you, Charlotte. So um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit, and we're getting near the end here, folks, so hang in there. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about um, refugees and resistance. So this is a picture from fairly high up of the Shati refugee camp, which is um, one of, I think, eight refugee camps in Gaza. And refugees really bear the brunt of um, the Israeli colonial settler project generally, um, the occupation and the siege specifically. In Gaza, 80% um, of the Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip are uh, refugees, and they're the most impacted by the kind of daily economic violence that Brian talked about. So the rate of, official rate of unemployment in Gaza generally is 40%, but in the refugee camps, you're talking double that, like 80% unemployment. They face the uh, daily violence and humiliation of having to uh, rely on the UN for its aid um, in these refugee camps that they're stuck in. And because they're in these overcrowded uh, conditions with poor infrastructure and haphazard building, they're the most vulnerable to the Israeli missile strikes and aerial bombing and incursions. But maybe the worst of all is the kind of psychosocial violence of displacement and dispossession and the denial of return. And this fellow who we talked to again in the Shati refugee camp uh, was driven off, driven from his home in 1948 uh, and had been in that refugee camp ever since. And you can see gathered around him. I don't remember that whether those are his grandchildren or his great grandchildren, uh, but many generations of his family were growing up in this refugee camp. So generations of Palestinians dispossessed in 1948 and 1967, right up to um, Charlotte was talking about the prisoners who were, who were displaced again. Um, and it's a violence of the denial of their right to their present and their future, because they, they want to return to the homes from which they were driven and the lands that are theirs. Uh, they can't plan, because their plan is to return home. So it's a kind of profound, a profound violence to have their right of return denied. But the people in the refugee camps are certainly not complacent victims. They're the backbone of the resistance, I would say. Um, and as you walk down the streets of the Shati refugee camp like we did, there's posters like this one on every block with different martyrs who've given their lives as part of the resistance. And this woman is holding, it's a heartbreaking story, she's holding a poster of her son who she hadn't seen or been in contact with for 10 years. He's uh, being held in an Israeli prison and they won't tell her whether he's alive or dead and they won't return his body to her. Um, but the, the, I think the refugees are the backbone of all the different forms of resistance. Um, including the armed, the armed resistance in Palestine. And they're also a bulwark against capitulation and a false peace because they realize that there's no real peace, no just and lasting peace that doesn't involve them actually returning to the historical homes and lands from which they were driven. Unfortunately, there's many private memorials for less public martyrs who didn't opt to be involved in the resistance, but paid the price anyways. This little girl, this picture's on the wall of a house in the Shati refugee camp. And she was killed by a fire that was sparked by an Israeli rocket attack. Um, her name was Hadika, which means uh, garden, and also refers to a historically Palestinian neighborhood in, um, in Jerusalem. So 
Charlotte mentioned Guevara Gaza and our uh, visit to his grave. So this is our, um, our visit to the grave of one of the heroic figures of the Palestinian resistance who um, really took up the strategies and tactics of guerrilla warfare within the refugee camps. And um, the, um, the continuum of resistance that continues today. The Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigades, Hamas, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and Islamic Jihad are all currently listed as terrorists by the Canadian government. As solidarity activists and progressive people, we don't have to be in solidarity with all or any of these organizations, but our government cannot label them as terrorists and cannot take armed resistance off the table for Palestine. So standing for a just and lasting peace starts with defending the right of Palestinians to exist and to resist in the ways that they see fit. Our, um, our experience in Palestine was extremely inspiring, partly because of the stories that you've heard tonight, some of which are sad, but a lot of which are about this profound and rising and growing grassroots resistance in, in Gaza, and we saw really the strength of, um, of the grassroots people's organizations of regular people who are building organizations and taking up resistance. We also, um, as leftists and revolutionary activists here in Canada, were inspired to see the growing strength of the revolutionary left in Palestine. I think the revolutionary left is the, um, is the force that offers the tools to Palestinians to challenge those parts of the Palestinian bourgeoisie that would capitulate and sell out the right of return and the basic national rights of the Palestinian people for their own benefit. They're the force that recognizes that the Palestinian struggle is part of a broader, broader Arab struggle against imperialism and colonization in the entire Middle East and Arab world. And I think they're the force that recognizes that the Palestinian people are part of and in many ways at the forefront of an international movement against imperialism and for change and for a real just world for us all. That's Thank all I want to say. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce our beloved comrade Khaled who's going to come up and uh, wrap up the night for us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is it. You're going to be released. In <laughs> A minute, uh, but just to 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 uh, wrap this uh, very important event, um, as you see, Palestinians are struggling on a thousand front: uh, the farmers, the workers, the students, youth, children, women, and all of these struggles are not separated from each other. They are connected very much. The strength of the Palestinian woman, particularly provide a backbone of the Palestinian society and the resistance. Uh, the um, role and the struggle of Palestinian students help in uh, strengthening the Palestinian youth movement. And all of these components, all of these sectors are what compose the Palestinian National Liberation Movement. Uh, Palestine is still a question of a people that is striving for their liberation, liberation of land, liberation of human, liberation of their resources. Uh, the struggle of Palestinians is, is, is a struggle about national and human rights. It's not a struggle for uh, better living conditions. It's not a struggle of just some violation of human rights that Israel conduct uh, on a daily basis. It is a struggle for self-determination, for liberation, and for equality between all people in Palestine. And thank you so much for being here and for your support. Thank you, Khaled, and thank you all the delegates for your, your stories. I know that you folks probably have questions for them. 
So um, if you can limit your statement to a question, that would be great. Um, and direct your, direct your question to whoever you'd like to answer. I'd just like to ask Jace whether the videos you took are going to be available on YouTube. Jace, will the videos be available on YouTube? Uh, yeah, I mean, this one I could put up at some point. Um, I'm not sure what site I'd put it up on, but I'll put it up somewhere and let Charlotte know, and then she can send it out. How does that sound? Yeah. And, and there, there, there will be more on the way, but this is the only one, one so far. You had a question back there. I saw your hand first. Yes? Way back. Lina? I have a, <clears throat> a simple question. I've never been in Gaza, and, and I've heard a lot um, describing the, uh, the tunnels. Can somebody describe what those tunnels look like? <laughs> what? I don't know. Some description? Um, <laughs> well, the, the tunnel that it turned out, even though we left at different times, we ended up taking the same tunnel back. And the tunnel in was one tunnel, and the tunnel back was a different one. The tunnel in, we walked through, and it was a, I don't know, it was maybe a five minute walk, roughly speaking. And it's uh, from Egypt, it, w it was, in, you know, it was w a wood structure, um, looked very solid. And, uh, and at some point, and I don't remember, um, maybe halfway, it, it changed, and, and a, lot, a lot of the wall was actually rock, or at least it was in places. The way back was um, a big, I don't know what other word to use, but to say a big freight elevator, um, which probably took you down about 50 feet, and we were driven through. It, it is the tunnel of that, that people uh, import cars through. Um, and it, it had, I mean, the drive was probably 50 minutes, uh, sorry, five minutes. Um, yeah, I would say that's a, that's a pretty good guess. The other delegates walked through. Yes. Oh, I, I got you. <laughs> and you know, the, 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 here, here's another little anecdote. When, when I was leaving, you know, there was, there was my friend Mohammed and, and, um, and another person uh, who originally, uh, Tarek, was supposed to uh, come through the tunnel with me, but at the last minute they, he wasn't allowed to. We were taken down, 50 feet down the shaft, and we sat there for a while, and then we came back up because there was another horse-drawn cart and a, and a kind of a motorcycle cart uh, coming the other way, and there wasn't room uh, to pass, so we came back up. But while we were waiting there for five minutes, I got two new Facebook friends. <laughs> back row, yes, Dan. Hi, thanks, everyone. I learned a lot from all of you. Um, my question isn't directed to anyone in particular, but to the group as a whole. Um, many of you talked about the problems of, um, or you gestured towards the problems of aid and charity versus actual solidarity. So I'm wondering if you can talk more about that distinction and actually kind of translate it for us in material terms, in terms of what um, Vancouverites in particular and Canadians in general can do uh, by way of solidarity with Palestinian people that doesn't um, border on um, empty gestures of charity um, and feeling sorry for the Palestinians rather than actually working. Um, thanks. That, that's an excellent question. And just uh, one thing that we heard from a, a huge amount of the organizations that we met with, the vast majority of them, was that, for example, they don't accept, even if they're offered it, aid from USAID because it's conditioned. And what the conditions are that they place on that aid, among others, are basically that nobody can work in the organization who is a member of any of, Pal of the Palestinian major political parties. And so what that aid tends to do then is depoliticize organizations de and, and disconnect them from the struggle. And it's a definite, like it's a direct, and it's a condition that they have to sign to in order to take that aid. And so they reject USAID out of principle and in protest um, of conditional aid that's imposed on Palestinians. And we just wanted to talk about this because a lot of times when people think about delegations to Gaza and people hear about the siege, um, the first thing they think is that people need humanitarian aid. 
And there are humanitarian needs that people have, um, particularly for things that are difficult to get through the tunnels um, or things that are hard to obtain in Egypt, particularly certain specialized kinds of medicines and things like that. Um, but the vast majority of what people are asking for from people in terms of breaking the siege isn't humanitarian aid. It's certainly not s sending food. We ate more food in Gaza um, in a day than we probably eat in a week in Vancouver. Um, it, it's not providing basic needs. Um, people are, are more than happy to do that for themselves. And in the case of the farmers and fishers, are struggling to be able to do that for themselves. Um, and so we wanted to, as a delegation, not be a humanitarian aid delegation, but be a people-to-people, -people, political solidarity delegation. Because people don't need money and they don't need supplies, but what they do need is to be able to travel freely. And what they do need is to be able to, and what they do need is to be able to move um, in Palestine and outside Palestine, and just to say, of course, Gaza isn't Palestine, it's one section of Palestine, and it's one section of the Palestinian people. There are seven mil over seven million Palestinian, there are over seven million Palestinian refugees, um, let alone Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and Palestine 48. So there are millions and millions of Palestinians around the world. Um, all of whom are engaged in a political struggle for national liberation. And so if we can work on struggling to combat what the Harper government is doing internationally and here at home, I mean, the war on refugee health care here isn't really separate from the war on refugees in Palestine. Um, and the war on immigrants and racialized people here isn't really separate from the being the first country to endorse the siege on Gaza, which the Harper government was. So in terms of fighting what the government's doing here, that's one of the first things that we can do. And also in terms of making alliances with organizations that are organizing people on the ground. And we, we had the opportunity to meet with those organizations and to make plans and to make alliances. This September 30th Day of Action for the Farmers and Fishers is being jointly called with the Union of Agricultural work committees. And we'd love to help bring people to have those alliances more and more. Those organizations would be happy to, to have people Skype into events, to really have more of a direct connection with the organizing that we're doing, so that when we're talking about, say, women in Palestine, we're not just kind of looking for an expert somewhere, but we're talking to the Union of Palestinian Women's Committees that has a grassroots membership of Palestinian women um, that are organizing to defend their rights. And so um, if, every, if people are signed up on that list, we'd be happy to send out contact information for the grassroots organizations and the progressive orga democratic organizations that we met with. Um, we had countless meetings over the week that we were there, and we'd love to share that contact information with others as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing your knowledge. I want to ask a question to the health team and education team. I, I'm glad you brought up some of the grandmothers in the film. I wasn't, I was going to ask you, are there any organized grandmothers group like we have Raging Grannies and can we have like Stephen Lewis Foundation, you know, they have this go go where they link grandmothers, Canadians, grandmothers with Chinese, South African grandmothers. And my second question is about the Catholic and Jewish uh, support in Gaza. Because last month I saw a film done by Catholic uh, University of uh, Catholic University of Bethlehem, where they showed the Gaza uh, daughter studying there and the challenges they were facing. So I highly recommend people to watch it. But I know I just want to ask: Is there uh, any presence of the religious? So the question is, grandmothers. <laughs> um, just very quickly, the question about the grandmothers, I'll leave the question about the Catholics to another delegate, but um, we didn't meet with any seniors organizations per se, but the Palestinian Developmental Women's Studies Association and Dr. Miriam Abudaka are actually working together to put uh, to put together a book on the stories of women political prisoners, many of whom are seniors or grandmothers. Um, I think many women are grandmothers, given the um, given the uh, vast numbers of youth. 
Um, but they're also um, working to have that book translated into English so it's more widely available to solidarity activists and we're hoping to see that come out in the um, near future. And as Charlotte said, if you're interested in contacting that organization, we have their contact information. Uh, was there any sense that the new Egyptian government might ease or lift the blockade uh, in the foreseeable future? The question is about the new Egyptian government easing or lifting the blockade at Rafa. Um, the new elected president in Egypt, uh, Dr. Mohamed Morsi, he said in the, his campaign, his, his election campaign, that he will immediately lift the siege uh, on Gaza. Uh, but the term lift the siege doesn't only include opening the gate of Rafah 24 hours, you know, um, seven days a week or or arrange it, but it, it means more than that. But the, the vast majority of people in Egypt are sick and tired of this closure of, of Gaza. They personally, I think the siege on Gaza was one of the reasons why the Mubarak regime was top, you know, like um, people revolted against because, because of, of Egypt's role, the diminishing of Egypt's role at the hands of the Mubarak regime. The new regime in Egypt definitely is different. Uh, the new president is different. But uh, lifting the siege so far, we didn't see a real step. But uh, Palestinians in Gaza definitely hoping that this will happen. And when he was elected, I know they were celebrating. So. Well, I thought you were going to avoid votes, but anyhow, that's a nice comment. Um, I know you're focusing a lot about the Harper government and Jason Kinney and Harper and so on, and I don't know what, how it could be different, because I, I, what, what perplexes me is, is the election of Tony Mulcair as leader of the NDP, with the support of Zionist support. What can we do to, you know, these politicians or even good people yeah. that are going to follow these political parties to raise this kind of awareness? I mean, we've got, you know, uh, uh, the, suspect, uh, the usual suspects here in this room we need to get this out there to the people and, and tell these stories, these Harper stories, to these people. And, you know, I mean, fine, we can change uh, Harper, but it will be <coughs> Mulcair or someone from the Liberal Party. But what difference is that going to make? All these political parties are supporting the Zionist uh, agenda. I, I think that's the case that all the political parties do. Um, and I think what that means is the strategy is to go to their base to go to whatever organizations and groups around them that you can intersect with and not depend on them. And that's particularly true of the NDP. There are some people in the NDP, as we all know, that are quite supportive, but the leadership is not. And so if we don't build that public base um, of support, then they're not going to move. And I think there are real opportunities to do that, but it starts by getting the messages out to all the organizations we can. I mean, you, you've seen in the United States the Presbyterian and Methodist churches having big debates, the United Church having a big debate. We're working on trying to get material on Palestine into the school curriculum. So there are a number of avenues that we can all take, but I, but I don't think we can depend on that that political leadership to do it. They're, they're going to follow, they're not going to lead. And you spoke about unions earlier too. So. And, and, and definitely unions too, and we, you know, we only have one union in Canada that's really taking a strong position, um, but there are other unions that are, that are moving in some direction, that's another important area. Oh, one more question. This is about all we have time for. There's one, one more thing following the question, so it, Tim asked the okay. question. Has the delegation produced a report, and if so, is the plans to email the report to MPs? Because I think that's the first step in getting kind of attention to where all that's going on. Yes. We are in the process of producing, we're in the process of producing the report itself, and, and, th and emailing it to, and sub submitting it to MPs sounds like a great idea, yes. and it definitely is a, a way to go from there.
And senators. Yes. yes. Well, I think all of, all of us in this room have at some point reached a time when we decided we will declare ourselves for human rights. And I think we have to keep on defending that. And I think we, we, we can't remain silent. And I think as we hear these stories, once you hear these stories, you can't unhear them. So I would suggest sign up and stay tuned and do what you can. There's one, I, we have one colleague here who's interested, who is involved in another little project that I think he wanted to just mention. Maybe you want to talk to Max afterwards about it. Uh, just a moment of time. I know it's late. My name is John Sue. Some of you know me as Max. I was in Gaza in, um, in March, and um, many of the delegates here spoke about the plight of the uh, fishers and the uh, tremendous difficulty that they have to confront uh, with the uh, blockade of the water and how really a traditional lifestyle has been prevented. They are violent prevented from pursuing. Um, a person I met there um, uh, when I was there, his name is Ibrahim Nayar, and I started a little miniature campaign to raise $600. I know it's something that you don't want to hear at the end of the evening, but you're, I'll just be outside and you could um, maybe talk, talk to me about that. There is a, a, a program called the OLIVA, which is an international uh, small grassroots campaign based in Gaza by the International Solidarity Movement and the local um, Union of Fishers, who goes, it's a small boat that tracks the, um, goes up with the um, fishers on their uh, daily fishing campaign and monitors the human rights violations that the uh, Israeli Navy uh, is responsible for and documents this and then uses that as a human rights uh, information and also uh, so text them and escort them. Uh, so I was wondering if we could help them and they spent, my friend there, uh, Mahfouz, emailed back and said, well, you know, that our little boat was recently uh, attacked by water cannon and the radio has been destroyed. So it's kind of like a micro mini project that I thought I would take on. And so we need $600. I've raised already $400. So if anybody wants to write out a check or give me $5 or $10, I think you have to do it. <laughs> I think, so thank you, Max. I think Jace has something he wants to add to that about the Oliva. And then I, but before we, we do that, I just want to mention that if anyone's fasting for Ramadan and they want to break their fast, we have some dates and water to drink. <laughs> Just to add what John was uh, was saying, um, one of the things that I did uh, when I was there, I, I brought the Oliva uh, a GPS device uh, called a Spot, yeah. and at the time I didn't realize that the radio had been uh, was was no longer working. So once uh, this radio is in place, there there will be a website set up where anyone can go at any time and check on the on the position. Uh, of the Oliva and, and its progress. Of course, it's not out every day, but it's, it, it's yet another way of, uh, of getting the word out about, uh, about what's going on. That's it, yes. So please, stay tuned, and all of you, thank you for all that you do, and let's keep getting the word out. <laughs>